Welcome to the Human Origin Project, where we explore the science of you. To keep up to date, go to our iTunes channel and subscribe, and please leave a review if you enjoyed today's show. Walter Crutman serves as the director of the Binary Research Institute in Newport Beach, California, and is the author of the best-selling book, Lost Star of Myth and Time, as well as writer and producer of the award-winning documentary film, The Great Year. The Binary Research Institute's main focus is on understanding the cause and consequences of solar system motion, particularly the phenomenon of the precession of the equinox. Walter's work at the Institute indicates that the mechanics of the well-known celestial motion have been misdiagnosed and are actually the result of our own solar system's motion, and that this motion has profound effects on life akin to the changing seasons. This discovery lends its validation to the worldwide ancient myth and folklore that our consciousness actually moves in a vast cycle of time with alternating dark and golden ages. In this episode, we interview Walter ahead of CPAC 2019, a conference exploring the science of procession. This year, it will be held at Newport Beach, California, and is hosted by some of the most preeminent experts in procession and ancient knowledge in the world. You book your place at cpacconline.com. Don't miss out on this rare opportunity. Hey, Walter, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. It's such an honor to have you here on the show, and we've really been looking forward to this one. Um, I've been looking into you know, your work for quite some time now, and obviously this is the procession of the equinoxes is something that you've been studying for a very long time, and you really devoted your um, your career to it. It's, it's amazing to hear your story. We're really looking forward to dive diving into that. Um, we'd like to know a little bit about you know how you started on this journey, like. You know, what was your, you, you, you know, your, your introduction to procession and thinking about, you know, you know, why it all happens and, and you know, where it all comes from? So it's, uh, it's kind of curious. I, I really, I guess I heard the term procession when I went through school, but I wasn't really aware of it after that. But I, I had always had a fascination with history and ancient cultures and was reading a book uh, that was actually written in 1894. It's called The Holy Science by Swami Sri Yukteswar. And in there, uh, he gave a, uh, a theory of history, which really made a lot of sense to me. Uh, but he related it to the motion of the solar system and then talked about the uh, backward movement of the equinoctial point. And uh, I had to actually go look it up and, and realize, oh yeah, he's talking about procession. And then I refreshed my my memory on it. But of course, um, the reason he gave for procession was very different than what I'd been taught in school and everything I read. And so it just uh, set off this stampede in my mind to find out, could this possibly be right? Um, because if it is, it's going to change the whole world. And so it, that was the book, The Holy Science. I remember reading that book as well um, and noticing that line. But at the time, I mean, it was a few years ago at the time, I had no idea where to look to sort of pursue that idea because it seemed like such a fire in that theory. And then we came across your work and I, you've, you've been doing this for, I don't know, over 15 years. What was the point when the and he dropped and sort of thought, right, there's something to this. Yeah, so uh, around the same time uh, that I'd read that book, I started having a lot of uh, dreams about this, you know, and and I didn't really have time for it because I was so busy in work and everything. And then um, kind of all of a sudden, I had a chance to sell a big interest in my business and I, this was around the year 2000 or so, and so I thought, well, heck, um, it's like everything's been set up for me to pursue this this very interesting problem, and um, and so that's what I did, and I just, of course, started reading every book I could on the subject, and that led me to to understand that there was a problem in the uh, procession calculations. Um, done by the IAU, the Inter 
National Astronomical Union. And if you just read, let's say, one year, the latest year or something, you wouldn't recognize the problem. But if you go back and you read, you know, 30 or 40 years worth of their bulletins and reports and stuff, you realize, oh, they keep changing the formula like every few years just to try to make it match what observations show. And so that's when I realized, you know, it's not quite as simple as uh, Newton had explained here. And in fact, the, uh, the theory had gone from Newton's time, when they call it loony solar causes, meaning primarily the moon and the sun were affecting the earth, causing it to wobble, to I think there's something like 4,000 inputs in the formula now so they pulled in jupiter and venus and asteroids and you know everything you can think of tides and atmospheric conditions to try to explain the actual changes in precession that occur each year so it, i love this thing with scientific um you know with where we look at mo modern scientific uh, literature looking back on the context always gives you an idea as, as to how we got there. It usually enlightens you as to, you know, potentially where there's some downfall. So it's, it, it's, and when I was reading your work, I was kind of seeing that pattern and you're, you're taking us right back to, you know, basically Copernicus and Galileo, you know, this idea where we're waking up from, um, you know, thinking that the, uh, the, the planets and the sun revolved around the earth and that there was this bigger problem and it, it, it just boggled my mind to think that this problem was going back to such a fundamental shift in human society and it actually goes back a lot further too there's a book called Hamlet's Mill that explores what ancient cultures because we know that ancient cultures talked about the procession they measured it and you know they discussed in quite a lot of detail didn't they about um you know, procession in the in the ancient languages, and, and really how it goes, you know, potentially further back than even the Greeks, where we attribute it to. Yeah, it's it's very true that uh, ancient cultures make reference to it. They don't always use the word procession, of course, uh, but they um, they definitely tied it to the changing of the ages um, and referred to. To it is almost like we would the seasons. Uh, of course, Plato uh, called it the great year um, or the perfect year. And yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of references that when you you might just read one and it sounds kind of obscure, but then you read a, a whole body, uh, which Hamlet's Mill is is great at sort of drawing together all these glimpses of ancient cultures into one book. Um, Giorgio de Santiana and Hertha Foundation were just brilliant. Um, and so it's, yeah, you start to see this pattern that this is like it, as common as talking about the weather what, uh, is today. You know, they were talking about procession 2,000 years ago. And in fact, if you uh, use the interpretation that, that we're kind of evolving towards, it's every bit as important as the weather because it, it talks about the the backdrop, the circumstances for for what life is like during different periods of time. And that's something that we found super fascinating, looking at these, I guess you can call them problems, where people don't believe that there could have been a higher knowledge or that there could have been things passed down for generations. Um, where do you think, uh, why, why do you think there's been such an adverse reaction to people, you know, had possibly holding this higher knowledge? Because I know it's been a long process of, you know, people people giving scathing attacks against researchers like yourself for even promoting the idea that um, you know the ancients potentially knew a lot more than we're crediting them for. You know, it, it's um, I think it's well intentioned. Uh, you know, we we came out of the dark ages. We got some knowledge. We we thought that we figured out everything. Uh, of course, we always think that. Um, and and we have evolved quite a bit since the dark ages of course and this but the theory of evolution has been applied uh, uh, so strongly that it, it kind of misses uh, ups and downs that might take place you know during very long periods of evolution 
And so I think it's, it's, it's really Darwin because before that period of time, uh, the great year was the dominant theory of history. Peoples all around the world, the Egyptians, uh, the ancient Greeks, the Polynesians, Nordic cultures, obviously the Mesopotamians, Sumer, Akkad, Babylon, etc., uh, all believed that history was cyclical. And then, then we went through the Dark Ages, much knowledge was lost all across the board. And then we emerged from there uh, thinking we were fairly enlightened and, and with this theory of evolution. And so with evolution comes the thought that anything prior to us must be more primitive. And so it's, it's, it's like they, they throw out everything, all, all ancient knowledge, all ancient wisdom. And, uh, and I think it was just an initial reaction. But people are now starting to realize that evolution is far more nuanced than uh, we once realized. And therefore, I think people are opening up to this idea that there could be uh, seasons within evolution. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, um, there's many scientific avenues going through this kind of awakening you know, process where evolution is a great example, you know, where you go from Mendel to, um, you know, understanding you know, Darwin's theory of evolution to, um, you know, the DNA helix. And then, you know, but just in the last decades, we're into epigenetics and quantum biology and the whole thing just gets so um, amazingly complex. Yet you find this basing in understanding back in, in ancient principles. And it's, it's amazing to see uh, that really blew me away when I was reading um, you know, your work on the procession of the equinoxes because this seemed like such a long and difficult thing to measure. You, know, you look at how modern scientific um, you know, astrophysicists, you know, the equations people use to try and understand this stuff, yet there were people that described it you know, quite, um, you know, not in the same way we do, but they certainly... Um, you know, qualified it in a way that uh, you know showed some understanding. That just blew me away, and you know, it crosses the Yuga cycle, the minds, their their calendar system was amazing. How would you describe today, um, you know, a modern de definition of the procession of the equinoxes? Because it's not something that people on the street kind of really talk about. You know, how do, how does in the astrophysicist uh, community how do we um, you know define it? It, it's a good point. Um, so, because I like to talk about the observable, what do you notice outwardly? Um, and therefore, I relate it to the other two motions of the Earth. So, uh, what you notice, uh, the, the uh, observable from the Earth's rotation, you know, Copernicus's first motion of the Earth, is that the sun and all the stars uh, rise in the east and set in the west and it's not because they're all moving around us of course it's because we're rotating and so people logically uh, buy that, that uh, observable is caused by that uh, celestial motion the rotation of the earth then the, the second motion that we're all familiar with of course is the uh, earth uh, revolves around the sun in a huge orbit every year and that causes a different observable instead of the stars going around us uh, every day. If you look carefully, there's a different constellation overhead, you know, roughly each month. And that's, and that's why we use the 12 constellations of the zodiac, even in modern astronomy, as a coordinate system to find out, uh, you know, where a particular planet is or something like that. So right now, you know, I guess if you see Jupiter, which is easy to spot in the early evening. Uh, you'll notice as it darkens a little bit, oh, there's a constellation of uh, Scorpio. So uh, Jupiter is in Scorpio. And it's just a quick way to aim your telescopes and figure out where something is. But anyway, they, that's a clear observable due to a celestial motion. So then um, we get to precession and the of course, it's a much longer period of time. It's not just a day. It's not just a year. It's, you know, over 20,000 years, close to 25,000 years. And uh, therefore, what you, the amount of change you would notice in a given uh, 
period of time is very small. You know, it's roughly one degree every 71 and a half years at the current rate. Um, and so it would take a lifetime just to notice a one degree change. Um, but that's how I describe it to people. It's, you know, you look at the equinox and you see what uh, constellation it happens to fall in. And you will notice that over a period of time, it's slightly moving through that equinox. And then, of course, if you tell people, you, you know, we've all heard of uh, the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And of course, everyone nods yes, uh, thanks to the movie here or the play. And so it's uh, people can kind of understand, oh, yeah, so it's this very slow motion of the stars. So that's the observable. Now, the reason that's given for it, they kind of mix it in. Uh, and so they say that procession is, and then rather than talk about the observable, they talk about what they think the cause is. It's caused by a wobbling of the earth, which is caused by the gravity of the sun and the moon tugging on the earth. Um, so because they don't actually talk much about the observable, it makes the problem very difficult to identify. And I hope I'm not getting too complicated for your listeners, but I think that's sort of the, the crux of why we don't understand uh, procession right today. But if, if you look at this other theory for procession, uh, that it's actually the observable from a solar system in motion, slowly curving through space, and as it does so, you know, you'll see different points in the sky, just like the Earth going around the the sun would see different points of the sky at different times. Then I think people can understand, oh, yeah, so it's just like that, but on a very That's long a, scale. Um, yeah, it's such a true ref reflection of our time. I, I feel like, you know, understanding that we're revolving around the sun um, and then deciding, yep, that's it. There's, let's not look any further. I feel like that's that's such a problem that we have in, a, in many ways on, on the moment on this planet is a very limited perspective and not being able to see past, you know, our own sort of uh, mind's eye. But, um... Yeah, but I totally have sympathy for Copernicus. You know, it's 1483s. You're not even out of the Dark Ages yet. They're pretty nasty times. And uh, he's just kind of corrected Ptolemy's system. You know, he had five books in his position, possession uh, when he died. Three of them were ancient Greek. One of them uh, talked about Aristarchus of Samos, who had, uh, you know, talked about the uh, heliocentric system, the sun in the middle versus the geocentric system that Copernicus and the, all the Dark Ages had, had grown up in. And so for him to straighten it out and said, okay, guys, it's not... Uh, it's not that the earth is in the center, the sun's in the center, but the earth's spinning, and that's why you see what you see. He had to have a stable sun. And he couldn't say at the same time, but the sun is also moving. You know, it, it was it have just been too much to get people to accept. And so he wrote his book, uh, De Revolute Unibus, um, which was uh, actually pretty well received for the time. Did you ever hear the no, story about that? The backstory, by the way. Um, there, there's, a, there's a guy. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Owens, I think, is his name. Who went to Harvard, and he tried to track down how many copies of that book were still around, expecting only to maybe find a dozen or something like that. And um, and the reason is, of course, the church had had banned the book. Remember he. Uh, at least passages of it that were supposed to be excluded. And um, so he went around and he's actually found now over 600 copies in the world. And they're in private collections and libraries and things like that. And he's learned a, a lot, you know, reading the margins and seeing who actually crossed out uh, what the church told them to cross out. And the only people that did that were right around Rome. And everybody else that had books and all the rest of the world, you know, didn't cop, didn't buy into the censorship. Um, but anyway, yeah, you could see how 
it was would have been tough for Copernicus to explain that the sun is in the center and that explains everything and also the sun is moving that's the only way you can explain precession so he didn't even attempt to explain precession well that's uh, there's there's such a common story among all um scientific uh disciplines that we've been discovering from doing um human origin projects there's sort of the same story of you know a huge idea comes forward and it's rejected and rejected and rejected and, until finally you know hundreds of years later people turn back and say oh yeah actually that, that was right and th- it's funny that our you know it's a very common reaction to be like no 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 no, no. who wants an idea let's just like <laughs> let's not talk about that um so with um in regards to the current models of precession um could you talk us through why why they don't really work when why the mathematics don't really work when you use a, a stable sun as, um, as the base sure yeah just uh, just very quickly though to uh if anybody's listening and wanted to read that backstory on uh, copernicus uh the name of the book is called the book that nobody read that's the title and so it's all about de revolute onibus and the author is owen gingrich and he really is is a great scholar does a terrific job oh great we'll put that in the um in the show notes for anyone that's interested yeah. And so your uh, particular question had to do with um, how the motion of the sun. Can you repeat it one more time? Yeah, sure. It was. It was just. Um, it was pretty much just asking if you can describe to us the problems with the current lunar solar models of that that try and account for precession. Yeah. So you know, a few hundred years after Copernicus. Um, people were trying to explain this third motion. He said there's there's rotation, revolution, and a libration, uh, which is his word for precession. And uh, Newton came along and said, well, it must be due to gravity, because they were that was the period of time they were explaining everything uh, through Newton. And uh, he gave, laid out a formula for it, but it looked and it looked pretty good at first, but uh, it took a long time to sort of match this formula against the actual observations for people to realize, oh, you know, Newton's wrong here. It just it doesn't work. And of course, you can't say that Newton's wrong. That sounds blasphemous. So uh, you just say he must have made one or two small uh, errors or left a few things out, and we'll just help correct this. And so what happens is there's a whole series of, of people that come along, uh, which I mentioned some of them in my book um, and various papers that start to add all these different components. And each person sort of thinks, ah, with just this one additional component, um, uh, you know, we will fix the precession formula, uh, trying not to break the explanation because the explanation that Newton gave is consistent with Copernicus, you know, and that's how science builds. You always want to be consistent with the prior scientists so you'll be more believable. Um, but uh, it just turns out that, you know, no matter how much you added to Newton's uh, formula, you couldn't quite fix it. Uh, but that's, we're still trying to do that today, even though many scientists today recognize that the sun does actually move but believe it or not they don't account for any motion of the sun in the precession formula and it's just i don't know it's a legacy problem (laughs) but um that's why i was so thrilled when i came across uh the the explanation given by sri yukteswar and you could kind of tested pretty easily and that's what we did we said oh if it's actually due to a moving sun a moving solar system rather than um, all these other things impacting uh, an immovable solar system uh, then we only need a few components since primarily uh, Kepler's laws that we're applying you know what's the rate of the curve through space and so we use the uh, basic numbers that Sri Yukteswar gave us and then looked at the precession figures going back for the last few hundred years, the the rate of change, 
and realized that, oh, this this new way, the Sri Yukteswar way of looking at, a, at procession is actually more consistent with the actual procession observations. And therefore, you can make it more predictable uh, with only about six components versus the thousands that are in the current uh, theory, Lumi solar theory. It's amazing such, uh, you know, what you would think is fundamental, you know, to our um, understanding of our, you know, the cosmos and, you know, what we observe is, you know, has such a deep-seated problem in it. I remember watching um, your documentary and seeing the, the 12 constellations, um, you know, circling around as we observe them. It's like a huge clock and, um, you know, really the pres- the procession of the equinoxes is like this huge clock, isn't it? Where the the equinox rises, like the hey guys, hand still of there, just clock that we look at every day, and that we look at the different constellations in this, um, like a you know, a period of of this larger cycle. Can you hear time. me? I can't hear and, you. Yeah, that really kind of changed my idea of um, you know time, and you know, the, hello, hello, you know there's hello. another cycle happening. A lost connection. And then when you start to think about you know these uh, problems with the lunar solemn you know, the, the idea that we, we explained it by the gravity of the moon and the so earth, right. which makes a lot of sense when you kind of see those, um, they, ex, they explain with that kind of gyration. Yeah, I just dropped. Um, you keep having brown outs, so I think models, don't they, a little start, bit. Um, starting bit. Oh, but okay. then when you think about it, like you say, is it when there's, we know there's movement of the sun and then all of the story since then really starts to show that there's more to it and it starts to, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> to reveal itself in different ways you know like the, the solar system for instance I, I didn't know this until i read your work um has a defined boundary and that's something that you know we only really relatively discovered recently there, there was all these little pieces of the puzzle that's, that hey, really kind of came out we... Here we go, hey, see, can you hear me okay uh, you cut out just you cut out for just a a little bit there. I think we lost power in the building here briefly. I'm not sure what happened, but um, it right. sounded like you were under a really great question. Can you just uh, summarize it for me? Yeah. So, I mean, basically, I mean, since the try to fix the Copernican problem with all these different, um, you know, fixes to the Newtonian calculations. There's all these other areas of evidence that have shown that we are, you know, that you know the solar system is moving. It has a shear edge. The um, the sun moves. There's a momentum problem, isn't there, with the um, with the sun? And all these different lines of evidence started to show that there's much more to the, um, you know, to explain precession. And it actually becomes more simple when we when we look at that larger context and see the solar system moving. Um, yeah, how would you, I mean, the solar system being a, a moving object, it's like a bullet, isn't it? And the, I mean, a lot of that evidence has vindicated what you were, uh, you know, what, all your hunches on procession. Can you take us through yeah. some of the yeah. discoveries? Yes, I've, um, I've written some papers on there that you can find at uh, the Binary Research Institute. And... Um, it's fascinating that there, there is a tremendous amount of uh, science that's going on in the whole, you know, discovery of our solar system. And we've been sending all these probes out now for about 30 years or so. And it seems like more and more pieces of the puzzle are coming together, um, especially the uh, the Voyager uh, 1 and 2, you know, they they were supposed to go out to the edges of the solar system and find out, uh, you know, what it was like. And of course they found out that it's not a heliosphere at all. It, it is more, uh, does appear to be more asymmetrical as, as if it is moving. And so there's a lot of indications that the solar system is moving at a very high rate of speed. And that of course lends credence to the whole idea that there should be some observable <laughs> to to this and of course the observable has been there all along right in front of our eyes we we just misdiagnosed it we we caused, said it was due to a wobbling earth and it's actually our whole solar system is moving at this incredible rate 
Because wasn't the Voyager mission deemed a failure because they they left the Earth trying to observe the wobble, or um, and they couldn't they couldn't do that. They could still see the procession was happening from outside of the Earth. Yeah, so th- they actually weren't looking at the procession problem. Uh, they were um, they were going to Voyager one and Voyager two. They did flybys of the of the various outer planets. I can't recall which ones right off the top of my head. Um, but I think uh, Voyager 2 used Jupiter's gravity to sort of slingshot and go off in one direction versus uh, Voyager 1 was a little more slow moving. Um, but anyway, when they got out to the heliosphere, you would expect that, you know, if it's a sphere, as as the name implies, uh, th- there be roughly equal distances from the sun. And of course, that's found was found not to be the case. And so it's not so much that they were looking for procession uh, issues, but some of the data they found helped us better understand uh, something that that helps us understand procession, and that is that the solar system is moving as, at a high rate of speed. Um, there, I think you m- might be referring to uh, Gravity Probe B, uh, which was a joint venture between uh, Stanford and NASA. Uh, NASA and they, uh, they primarily sent up a probe that would go into a polar orbit. And it was, um, it, it was this perfect gyro. And they actually weren't looking at, at the ordinary procession problem because they assumed that's all fixed and well known. But they were looking at uh, Einstein's uh, relativity problem, which is a type of precession, if you will. Uh, he says, you know, that anything, any big mass will bend space a little bit. So they were trying to pick up that. And in doing so, they got some strange readings. I was actually in touch with uh, Stanford before then, before they sent it into space. And I said, you're going to find something very unusual. And I think they probably put my letter into the crackpot file, <laughs> but they, uh, <laughs> after they did find stuff that was unusual, um, I think it was 12 to 18 months into the project, they started, uh, they were pulling their hair out trying to figure out what's going on. And because uh, NASA was giving Stanford some trouble saying, well, what's going on? How come we're not getting clean data? And uh, because they just thought it was noise. And I basically predicted that if precession is due to the motion of the Earth, then you're going to see a a signal from from that due to the motion of the solar system. I'm sorry. So one signal you'll see is uh, every orbit you make around the Earth in your polar orbit you know, you'll record that. And then another signal you start to pick up is as the whole Earth is moving, your your probe, which is attached to the Earth in orbit around it, will be picking up part of that orbit. And, uh, but there'll be a third one, and but it'll be very subtle and in the background. And, and so that's the one that they then called me up and said, hey, how'd you like to visit Stanford? We'd like to give you a tour. <laughs> I said, oh, I'd love it. And so I went up there and ended up meeting with, with all the top guys. And then they, they sort of said, well, now, how did you know there was going to be noise here? And um, They never actually admitted that it was, uh, you know, that it was uh, due to an incorrect theory about precession. But I think they appreciated having a, a different way to explain it and so if you read the history of that project uh, nasa ended up giving them an f because they failed to uh properly detect einstein's uh, theory and then they went out and got some private money after raising like 800 million from the government they got another like half a million from a saudi guy to finish it up and they said they corrected the data to prove einstein and then they shut the books on the on the project. Wow. Well, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's amazing to see. And so 
what they they never actually you, you discuss this idea of possession being this cause of the second motion did you and it, it never really cut through in a way it didn't sound like they really um you know admitted or looked into it very deeply they were just trying to find their own preconceptive maybe um you know data points basically that they thought they would find yeah well some of the guys were less guarded than others i mean the program heads were kind of guarded of course but uh, a few guys in the room when we got into it a little bit uh i had brought jeff marcy with me he was head of uh astronomy at berkeley at the time just so i had at least one extra guy on my side of the table <laughs> and uh they said wow wouldn't that be interesting if we're near a, a big star that we can't see something that's pulling on the earth and that's what's causing our noise and so they were assuming it was a black hole and this was long before mike brown and the guys at Tel- caltech uh, started uh, claiming that there's some ninth planet, some big mass that's pulling our whole solar system. So, yeah, it was it was really interesting to to hear that from uh, the Stanford guys. Have you been following what's going on at Caltech? No, not 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 too close, too closely. Sorry, only really from what we've heard you talk about and um, other there are a few other authors that talk about. Um, not not so much procession, but other astronomical phenomenon that mention him quite a lot. Um, it's interesting now that they're that they're openly looking for another planet or another object that our solar system is potentially um, in a binary pairing with. That's um yeah that, exactly. that must be really yeah it must be really yeah it must be really nice for you you know from doing this for so long to finally have people catching up and sort of cluing into the to understanding that there might be, um, yeah, there might be some truth in what you've been working so hard on. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate you saying that because, yeah, when you work on something for 15, 20 years and nobody acknowledges it, it kind of gets you, uh, uh, you need a little cheering up now and then. But, yeah, to to have uh, Caltech come out and Mike Brown and um, Batigen uh, basically say there's got to be some mass out there and then to watch the way that's evolved that they keep finding more and more things that are affected so as you probably recall they first noticed that the the dwarf planets uh uh were having these long extended orbits that were inclined to the plane of our solar system and one or two you know could have just been random some reason they don't know but when they saw a bunch of them sort of all pulled in the same direction with all similar perihelions, their closest point to the sun, uh, they just said, wow, this this can't be a coincidence. Uh, there must be something affecting that. So they, they've been looking. And then I think they were looking just by themselves without telling anybody else for a while, hoping they could make the big discovery. But they've since opened it up, uh, told the world. And so as they've told the world, more and more telescopes are pointing in this same direction, roughly in the direction of Sirius Orion, looking for some big mass. Um, but uh, they've also found other indicators. Uh, so it's not just the dwarf planets that are uh, splayed out with these very elongated orbits and inclined, but um, even the major masses in our universe, uh, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are being dragged down about 6% below the plane of the uh, solar system where it should be based on the sun's uh, gravity. And so, and that is a problem that actually people have known about for a hundred years, but they didn't have an explanation. So it was just a little factoid that sat around in the history books. And now they've used it as evidence that this mass that is out there has to be not just one to two earth masses but they're now up to about 10 to 20 earth masses and uh, also the periodicity uh has grown at first they were thinking oh maybe it's you know five thousand years seven thousand years twelve thousand years now they're up near twenty thousand years so they're getting very close to the actual uh, procession number so all this stuff is going on and I think 
what's amazing though is you know whenever we've noticed perturbations in the other orbits they find the the perturbing object pretty quickly so when uh, uranus uh, gave us some signals that something else might be out there they found neptune within 48 hours and when Neptune uh, gave us some s signals that there might be something else out there. You know, they have to watch the orbit for a period of time. Uh, they found Pluto within 24 hours using 1931 technology. And now we find something that's perturbing the entire solar system. All the big masses, all the little masses. And it's supposed to be, you know, much, much larger than, than Pluto by, you know, 100 X or something like this. And They've been looking for two years and haven't found it with all the modern technology. So it just is one more clue that it ain't a planet. It is something bigger going on. And that's why I'm so excited. It is really exciting too. And, and there's in the broader understanding of the universe, we've kind of moved towards, you know, most stars are in binary systems out there. Um, when was all that happening? And what was the, um, I mean, can you explain the you know how binary systems work in a way, and you know because we're talking about this motion, um, you know our solar system in um, in movement, and and that was that was actually one image from your um, documentary that really really blew my mind. Was seeing our sun in motion through space and the planets going around in this. Um, in, in its orbits while it's hurtling in its own orbit. It's just, it really changes your consciousness to really see, um, you know, this other third motion that, you know, like you say, all the evidence is showing us that it's there. How do binary systems work and what are the implications? Because, you know, when we go back to the ancients, they talk about these different times and effects and we know the physiological effects that the sun has on the earth, dark day and night, um, you know, vitamin D3, melatonin, you know, our bodies are intricately connected to, um, you know, the cosmic energies of the sun. You know, what are the implications of a binary system? And, you know, are we heading into, you know, potentially a, a time of daylight? Yeah. So, wow, that's, that's a huge question. Um, so you're right. It's as amazing as it is that, to discover that there is something gigantic that is affecting our entire solar system from a gravitational standpoint, it's a thousand times more amazing to then start to realize that it's affecting all of history and consciousness that's sort of in a pattern very similar to the seasons. And, uh, and the implications that ha that has so and that's kind of why this problem was so fun because it has such huge ramifications you know uh just discovering that there's a big mass that's affecting our whole solar system uh what's even a thousand times more amazing is is the implications that it has because uh it means that these ancient myths from all around the world as you know, that were documented in Hamlet's Mill and other places uh, have some truth to them. And so I think instead of denigrating our ancestors uh, as being more primitive than we are, uh, we now start to mine that, uh, our ancestors' information, the ancient wisdom, and ask, you know, well, why are they building pyramids and ziggurats and, and dolmen and cairns and, and why so many different types of objects and what sort of vibrations they, they uh, uh, emit our subtle energies? You know, how do they interact with electromagnetism and our sun? And, you know, why was there this worldwide interest in building them and how can we use them today? And I just think there's just thousands of questions that, are, are pop up when we realize that we're going through cycles and if you really study the cycles as you know because there's a fair amount written about them in the greek culture and in the indian culture um, where they called them yugas uh, it can actually give you a glimpse into what things might be like in the future and i think we can do a much better job at planning 
So something I like to say is, you know, it's like we've all had amnesia uh, because we've forgotten this huge part of our history and the pattern of history. And when we remember that the yugas or the cycle of the great year is real, it changes our perspective and I think brings a healing to mankind. Yeah, it's interesting uh, because, I mean, when I started looking at your models of um, your explanations of binary stars, you know, it, it, it really began, I think of physiology, right? So it, it really began to make me think of, you know, what we know. You know, you mentioned all of this came to you through dreaming, right? Through your, what your subconscious told you while you were while you were asleep. And, you know, you say with, um, this idea of amnesia, you know, have we gone through a period of relative sleep and we are waking up to the fact, you know, via the motion of the procession of the equinoxes and, you know, moving maybe into a new field of, um, you know, whether we call it, you know, uh, age of um, energy, you know, we know that there's many cosmic influences from um, many different types of energy and really the force that a binary partner would have on our system would be you know, really beyond our our thinking. It just blows my mind to think about that. Uh, it, astronomically, how would you, you know, as stars are born and kind of they you know, taking different orbits, um, you know, how, how does this work and, and how would this, how does the mechanics and, you know, what, what could we take from this, this model and thinking about, you know, how we live in this? Yeah, so actually there's a lot of study going on right now uh, about how stars are born, why so many of them form in pairs, binary systems. I think it's something like 80% of all stars. Um, you know, they're not exactly certain, of course. Uh, these are big, big questions. Um, but the fact that these celestial events uh, seem to affect our consciousness is is pretty easy to, to understand, in, in my opinion maybe not the exact mechanics, but if you think about, you know, just the earth revolving on its axis and our bodies are adapted to the light of the sun. And so we, we actually change states. We go from a waking state uh, when we're mostly in the light to a subconscious state when we're mostly in the dark. And, um, and it's, 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 it's a huge change, but it happens so frequently every day literally that uh, we don't think much about it but if it's happening on a daily basis and the annual motion is affecting all the seasons and migrations and spawning and hibernations and all these you know it's affecting trillions of of plants and creatures then it's then you can start to realize that okay so if there is a third uh, orbit of some type uh, you know, it's, it's not a simple revolu rotation or revolution. It's the actual entire solar system with all these rotating, revolving uh, bodies uh, going around something even greater. Uh, it too must have a, an awfully massive effect. But that effect, of course, is over a very long period of time. And so we hardly notice it except over the long term. And would it be, because um, if two stars are created and their masses are different, their orbits will be, um, they'll take, one will take slightly wider part. So the fact that we don't know about this, is it possible that we are orbiting around a much bigger partner and we've taken a very wide path and potentially, you know, maybe moving back into its, um, you know, its close presence? Yeah, I, I think we're just at the early states of, really understanding how solar systems, multiple star systems, uh, you know, stellar neighborhoods and galaxies work. Um, you know, it's only a few hundred years since we kind of figured out our solar system and now we're starting to figure out it might have a partner. Uh, but there's uh, much bigger motions going on. And, and what what stands out to me is that there's effects going on at a much greater distance than we earlier thought. So we do know, you know, the roughly four, what is it? No, it's 
closer to a trillion stars, I think, is the latest estimate in our galaxy. I think when I wrote my book, it was like 400 billion. But um, that all the stars seem to be going around the Milky Way itself. And when you look at other galaxies, there's there's something that's holding them there. And to to dis- because we don't see the enough mass to cause that gravity, uh, we have to turn to exotic explanations that we still don't understand. Of course, one of those is dark matter and another is dark energy. Um, so, man, we are so early in this thing, I, I can't even comment anymore. <laughs> that's, that's, that's been a real interest of mine since we've undertaken this, this project. Just seeing, you know, I had so many preconceived ideas that everyone had things figured out and we were just going to be learning what everybody knew. But the further you look into each specific discipline, you realize that we're still just scratching the surface on so many different problems and so many different issues that are so fundamental. Um, you know, as fundamental as the seasons are and, you know, day and night cycles are to the human body, we might be missing this whole larger picture that's potentially influencing, as you said, you know, every life form on the planet, just in a very more subtle sort of way. Um, yeah, what, what yeah you think? Know, I had a friend, uh, I, I'm sorry, you go ahead. Oh, no, no, sorry, go on. I'll, um, I'll ask you in a second. So we have this conference every year. It's called the Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge, uh, just about every year. And uh, we have our 11th one coming up this year at the Marriott Hotel in Newport Beach, October 4th to 6th, where we bring together a bunch of scientists in different fields to look at this uh, idea of a great year and how we can uh, how it's going to affect everything and how that can help us better understand ancient cultures, etc. Um, and one of the speakers we've had one or two years is um, Gary Evans. He's a, he's a really good friend of mine. Uh, and he he's in England uh, and he does something called forest bathing. And when he first told me about it, I thought, what, you go out in the forest and take a bath? And no, he <laughs> says that they realize that uh, nature is really important to our our mental health and our physical well-being in many ways that we're but subtle ways that we're just beginning to understand and so he's working with many of the uh, big universities in England and uh, they take people out to the forest and then they do a B tests and stuff and it appears that the the trees and plants are emitting something we need, not only oxygen, of course, but other uh, subtle elements. And um, and they're finding they can have, you know, curative effects, especially in some of these subtle things that affect great parts of our modern society, as stress, anxiety, depression, stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, isn't that amazing work that just getting back to nature uh, and realizing that having a lot of trees and having things very natural around us can be tremendously beneficial to our health and well-being. Uh, I think, you know, that's the type of knowledge we'll be discovering more and more as we start to really learn from our ancient uh, ancestors rather than just ignore them. Absolutely. And when you look at, you know, you just look at what we knew about you know, 20th century model physiology and this idea that we're stuck in this, um, you know, very, you know, matter and um, very matter of fact based of understanding of the body. But, you know, we've moved into this idea of the human microbiome, epigenetics, um, and now the quantum effects of energies, like you say, and nature has this very, very subtle way of, of, affecting us and it's just fascinating how do you see to finish up and we'll, we'll talk about the because we're really excited about the um about the conference um but what do you think will will be the turning point for the scientific community to confirm that the sun is a binary you know when will that copernican revolution will happen or in your mind oh i think we're getting pretty close you know within a decade uh, or two, maybe. Um, and, you know, there's an old saying, science evolves at the rate at which old scientists die. And, you know, sometimes 
you kind of have to have the old people that are protecting the old ideas just kind of stop defending them before the new ideas are really thoroughly discussed and, and more accepted. Um, but the building amount of, of evidence that's taking place is is uh, just, to me, it's, it's reaching a crescendo. Never have we gone this long knowing that something massive is affecting our solar system without being able to find it. So it's, it's just a matter of time before some brave souls say, well, maybe it could be something besides a planet, you know? And, and I think that's where actually Einstein pointed the way. You, you know, just a couple of years ago, they were able to confirm Einstein's theory of gravity waves, uh, which is important because I think there's a missing element. It's that we need to understand how bodies can affect us at a greater distance than we heretofore believe. And, and when we can find, find that missing link, uh, which is probably some sort of gravity wave, then I think we'll be, uh, it'll open the field to, instead of just looking for nearby masses, they'll consider what stars and what star systems could be affecting us nearby. And to me, the, the Sirius star system is, is one of the most interesting uh, because it's it's very close. It's the deepest, heaviest thing in local space, may, meaning on the Einstein grid makes the deepest dent because it's three solar masses. Um, and it, it has a very special star, Sirius uh, B, that that goes around Sirius A that our own solar system seems to be in resonance with. Um, and so I think Sirius B is creating this big gravity well around Sirius A and it's causing gravity waves. And that's somehow a strengthening the connection uh, between our systems. So I, I know it's not enough to put a paper together on, but uh, that is the direction that most of the major telescopes are now pointed looking for a ninth planet. So I think, uh, I think we're getting close. It's so fascinating, isn't it? How, you know, you mentioned the Sirius star system, how in ancient times Sirius was used as the, you know, the benchmark for starting the, the year. It's something that the Gregorian calendar is sort of lost. Um, but for many ancient cultures, you know, Sirius was this, this almost beacon for them, like that um, there'd be so much mythology and so many stories and, um, so much science going, studying Sirius and understanding its orbit and remembering exactly where it is in the sky. And um, it seemed like that connection to Sirius has been embedded in cultures for, you know, since day one almost. Um, yeah, has, there's has a lot of mysterious myth and folklore about Sirius out there. Plus, a lot of scientists have noticed unusual features about it. And so I think it's a great candidate for us to, to look at. It's so interesting, isn't it, when, you know, ancient thought and modern science start to meet, and I feel like that's happening more, more often in so many different fields. It's a really exciting time to be, you know, involved in it all. You must be, uh, yeah, you must be over the moon that it's all starting to come, come together. I am, and I wish it was a simpler problem, but <laughs> um, I guess it's, you know, the more complex problems are actually more fun. You get longer time to work on the puzzle. Well, credit to you, Walter. You can certainly tell that you're a person that likes to dive into the detail and, you know, really sift through the evidence. So, you know, kudos to you for all the work you've put into this. Tell us a little bit more about CPAC because we're really excited about that and, you know, this discussion that you'll we'll be having about procession and, you know, its effect on humanity and, you know, really where, where all this is leading. So I really hope that it's not 10 years before the scientific community <laughs> admits this and that, you know, hopefully this conversation starts to resonate, um, you know, a bit more widely s sooner. Yeah. You know, these things uh, do unfold. I, I, when you read that, uh, that book by Owen Gingrich, you realize that a lot of people were buying into a Copernican system actually well before Copernicus wrote about it. And then even though he wrote about about it and that we date it now to 1483 the date the book was published 
It then took a few hundred years until it was widely accepted after that. So, you know, it's there's no clear demarcation of these things.、Um, but anyway, yeah, we do talk about all the implications of、uh, a binary system and how it affects anthropology, archaeology, astronomy,、um, just just the whole way we look at history.、Uh, And so,、uh, Dr. Shock will be there. He's a geologist from Boston University,、uh, famed for、uh, stating that the Sphinx and, and many structures on the Giza Pyramid are probably far older, older than earlier thought.、Um, and he and others will also be talking about Göbekli Tepe.、Um, and then、um, I, I would just refer people to the website. It's CPAK. Online.com, and you can read about all the speakers that will be there. And of course, all of your audience is invited to attend. It's going to be a fun thing. Yeah, it's a great event you've put together. I think it's important that these conversations are brought together and happening, and especially you know people like yourself that have you know, and, and Dr. Shock that have you know, devoted their lives to really understanding very difficult problems. And so, you know, I for one have to thank you very much for that. Um, you know the way you're devoting,、um, you know, so much energy and and, and passion to this. It's it's really refreshing, and I'd, I'd really encourage people to read your book,、um, Procession in the Lost Star: A Myth in Time, and also check out your documentary if they're interested in this, because it really brings together,、um, you know, a lot of difficult scientific information in, a, in an enjoyable and digestible fashion. Well, thanks. Yeah, and it's on Audible Book or Kindle Book, so you can just listen to it if you like. <laughs> awesome! Thanks so much for joining us today, Walter. It's been it's been so interesting talking to you, and yeah, looking forward to seeing you at CPAC.、Uh, good. I look forward to that. Thanks so much. Take care, guys. Thanks, Walter. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to today's show. For more information, you can read the full transcript. Articles and discussion on our website humanoriginproject.com. You can visit us on social media at Human Origin Project on Facebook and the Human Origin Project on Instagram. Follow us on Twitter or join the forum boards and email list to keep up to date with all the new information. And if you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. Because it helps others to find this information and helps us to bring you the topics you want to discuss and hear about. Until next week, I hope your life is filled with happiness, healthiness, and harmony.